Okay, we are in section 16.2. In this section, we're going to talk about the logic of ANOVA. And again, remember, ANOVA is short for analysis of variance. And all analysis of variances is a partitioning of variation between the data. As I explain, hopefully this becomes more clear how we go about doing this. Remember, the objective is to compare several population means on a variable. Okay, so that is our objective here. We just want to compare more than two population means on a variable. Now, uh, a couple of terminologies here. So here we have one variable, and the variable is resulted from classification by one other variable, which we call the factor. Now, the possible values of the factor is what we call the levels of the factor. Okay, and I have a couple of examples here for you. So, for example, let's say the variable that we are measuring is the crop yield. And the factor here that we are considering, which we believe affects the yield of a crop, would be fertilizers. And these are the levels of the fertilizers, A, B, C. In other words, I have three different fertilizers that, I'm, that I would like to compare and measure the yield of the crops from these three fertilizers. Okay, so here's one example. The other example would be this one. So my variable that I'm collecting, that I'm measuring here, would be sales. Suppose these are retail sales for a company. The factor that I believe affects sales would be region. So in other words, we would like to see the effect of region on sales. Now the levels of this factor are north, south, east, and west. Okay, so that's pretty much what the factor and levels are. Now, the null hypothesis in this chapter, it's always going to be equality of means, however many means there might be. I could be comparing two means, which, will, which is what we did in chapter 10. So I could have as few as two and as many as uh, a finite number of populations. It could be 5, 10, 15, as long as there's a finite number. So k here is the number of populations that we are comparing. The alternative, actually, it's stated differently here. And I made it simple. The alternative is going to say that not all means are equal. So, for example, uh, north and south, the means could be the same, but south and west could be different. East and west could be the same. East and north would be different, and so on. So that's what the alternative means. Not all the means are equal. So, now here's the logic of how we're going to go about it. Hopefully, see if you can, you can follow this. So here what I have is, same variable, this could be sales. Okay, so I'm looking at sales in one region, sales in another region. Now this is the data that's collected in one region, and here I have data that's collected in the other region. Now one thing here, the assumption we have is that the variability in sales that are collected in this region are almost the same as the variability among sales within this other region. Now, this is my sample mean from the first region, sample mean from the second region. Clearly, they are different, right? The samples, they're not exactly the same. Now, the question that I have on the side here, are the sample means different, x bar 1, x bar 2? Are they different because the mean in the populations are different? Or is it because the deviation between the two samples is large? Now, when we talk about deviation between, means the sample above and the sample below. Deviation between these two is large. And that's what's leading to that, um, the means to be different. So, now... To clarify this, let's take a look at this one. Okay, in this next example, suppose again I have my sales data from two regions. Now notice here that the data, both of these samples, 
the data is not as dispersed as the one up here. See, the dispersion is high here, and so is here. Now, here I have dispersion that's low, dispersion is low. So, in this example, in this layout or design, the difference that I observe between the means could be attributed to the fact that the population means we are sampling from are different. In other words, the average sales in West is different than the average sales in South. Because the deviation between the two sample is small now. So look at the deviation between them now. Now, inside of these dots, these are within the sample. So there are deviation within the sample, deviation within the scores in this sample. Notice these are tightly compact around the mean, this one as well. So the deviation within is rather small as opposed to being dispersed up here, which causes the between deviations to be large. Okay, now, so here's the logic of how we're going to go about doing this. We're going to compare two variations. So if variations between the samples, and here's what I have, this is between within means inside each sample, which by the way, we assume that these deviation within or inside each sample would be equal. And we made that assumption in chapter 10 also when we compare two population means independent samples, section two, I believe. So if variations between the sample mean is large relative to variation within the sample means, then uh, that's what we want to do. If that variation is large, then we're going to say the means are different. Okay, so let me finish that sentence. So if variation between sample mean is large relative to variation within sample means uh, within the samples, then we're going to conclude that mu1 is different from mu2. There you go. That's what we want to do. Now, uh, it's important that we have this next assumption. Okay, this next assumption we have here, we're going to assume the variations within each sample. And of, of course, the population that we are sampling from within the respective populations are equal. Okay, this assumption is very important. So, now commonly we call this assumption the assumption of homogeneity of variances, and some also call it homocedasticity. So, homogeneity of variances or homocedasticity. Homo means being the same here in this case, um, it's synonymous to homogeneous. So, homogeneity of variances means variances being the same. Now, in section 6.3, by the way, I have this. Uh, that would be our next lecture. In section 16.3, uh, we can formally test this assumption, by the way. It's, it's part of the run of the ANOVA in StatCrunch. And I'll show you that later on in next lecture, not this one. So the test that we use in order to test for homocedasticity is called the Levine's test. There is several tests. The one that we use is called Levine's test. Okay, and StatCrunch does that. And uh, here's again, uh, just to kind of reinforce what we're thinking. So I have three different populations here. Notice the means are different. And the within, within variabilities here, the within deviation, the variabilities are small but between them are large so this is why if there are differences in sample means we're going to attribute that to the population means being different and remember we assume these uh, the population deviations within each of these would be equal now how are we going to translate variability in our work so variability for us means variance right and from chapter three i'm going to recall this formula we had from chapter three remember the formula for sample variance is when we talked about sum of square deviations from the mean right that's the numerator notice i have in quotation sum of squared so i want you to remember those words 
because that's what we're going to use in the next section. So we have sum of square deviations in the numerator. And then in the denominator, we have n minus 1. This n minus 1 in the denominator, what it does is it averages those square deviations. Okay, so s squared, therefore, is averaged sum of squares. And that's the terminology we want to use for that. Now, here we're going to get into something interesting. Okay, so here's the idea behind the ANOVA, is that we're going to, and this is what I meant by partitioning the, the variability in data. If you look at the total variability among all the scores, regardless of which population they came from, so let's say if I have sales figures from south, sales figures from west, north and east so i have four different samples if i ignore the region and i just call those sales the total variability would be variability of all of those sales nationwide okay regardless of the region so that's what total variability is it's the total variability in the data sorry about that <clears throat> in our data that total variability is going to be equal to variability between the samples plus variability within each sample. Okay, so going back to my diagram here, that would be the total variability means, I'm up here folks, the total variability means variability among all of these scores in all population. And of course, I'm working with the sample here. So it's going to be the variability among all of these. So the total variability of all of these is going to be the sum of variability that's inside each of them, which is common, right? We assume to be equal, plus the variability that's between them. Now, how does that translate mathematically? I will show you a rather strange mathematical expression in a moment, which justifies what we're saying here in a minute so the key is that remember variability translates into sum of squares for us okay now what i just wrote up here total variability is variability between samples plus variability within each sample which is soon to be equal and variability is sum of squares so from that from up here we actually go down here so let me actually trace that for you and see if this total translates into this okay there you go this total variability translates into total sum of squares if we assume or if not assume but if we follow the fact that by variability we mean sum of squares okay now, here's, you're going to see a very strange looking expression. I just want to show you the mathematics of it. Um, and, and then very briefly, and then we'll depart from it. Because remember, this is not a course in mathematical statistics. But it's for those who wonder, like, well, how does the mathematics of this is all going to work? I mean, it all sounds good in theory, but what about in practice? Why does the total variability on the left actually equal to these two? So, because it's not obvious from the, the sketch or the design, right? So, and I have here again, I'm warning you what's to come. The mathematics of above statement or below, but you may totally ignore this. <laughs> okay, again, this is just for the curious minds. And there you go. So this is what that expression above leads into and again i don't expect you to even be able to follow this but i just want to show you that there's something behind the scene here that's going on and the mathematics of it of course is something that keeps it all together right okay so that's what this is um, and you can kind of see the left side is total sum of square equal to sum of square between plus sum of squared this is going to be uh, sorry, 
this is going to be between this is going to be within and again if you don't follow you have no idea what this strange looking greek expression is don't worry about it so now i have like three four bullets and we'll be done with this section and in our next section we will actually take a look at um what you call it we'll take a look at a numerical example and we'll go through stat crunch and actually do this so so here's how again i'm just going to recap everything for you so if we take the ratio keep that in mind we're going to take the ratio of average variations between groups and average variations within each group which is assumed to be equal but unknown the variation within is assumed equal but unknown so we're going to take that ratio this ratio is going to be an f ratio now this f comes from previous section remember we just came out of that section 16.1 we talked about fisher's distribution that's what that f is it's fisher's distribution probability distribution so this ratio will be an f ratio and we're going to call that our test statistic and if uh, the f that ratio is large we're going to reject an all hypothesis if that ratio is large remember the numerator is sum of squares between denominator is sum of squares within if sum of a square between is large that's how f can be large is f is f as if the numerator is large and the numerator was sum of squares between so we're going to reject the null <coughs> means the means are not equal not all of them are equal and here's the last thing yeah it is about what we're about to get into in the next section all of our hypotheses in chapter 13 section 16.3 not 13 chapter 16 section 16.3 which is about to come all of these hypotheses that we do using ANOVA will be right tailed tests and that's because we want to reject the null if f is very large so we always look at the right tail although the null is equal and the alternative is not equal so there you have it and we are done with this section again i know it was very conceptual that's that's the thing about this section it's very conceptual at least this section but don't worry in the next section we actually look at um, the uh, ANOVA table and we are going to actually do uh, an example using StatCrunch okay so with that we are done with this video